read it a little bit more carefully. That means you might read five paragraphs instead of three. But, you know, it does give you a little bit of a lay up there. What he told us is that he would put you in the profile. And there's the profile and there's the slush pile. So he's less exhausted, literally, at this point. You laugh, but um, I submitted a story to Asimov in 1987, 1988, and I thought, I knew, I, I was unpublished, I thought, this is it, I can feel, this is a publishable story, I've had a breakthrough, this is good, it does a lot of things, and I got the form rejection, as well, of which I had a stack. I sent it to the Fantasy and Science Fiction, and got a, a, a response, uh, handwritten, uh, Alan Datlow sent me a response which would have seemed like an acceptance, except for the fact that she, she said it was too much of another story she published. If, but it, if it hadn't been attached to the manuscript, I would have thought the story was accepted. So I went down through the tears. Analog sent me the how to write an analog story, meaning this is really good, but it's not what we publish. Um, and then I finally published another story in Asimov's. And because I am that kind of person, I sent the story back and I bought it instantly. And I said to Sheila Williams, you rejected this. She said, we shouldn't have, but we get tired. I mean, she was apologetic, but honest. Well, you do get tired. Um, I know that I, when I have, go through my slush, I can only read it for an hour at a time. And then I start hating the stories before I pull them out of the envelope, which is not fair. <laughs> so I have to put the manuscript down and back away and go do something else. For a while. So in that sense, yes, I can say it gets you a different read. But the different, it comes to that by with a set, a completely different set of expectations as well. Have you had uh, people who have gone on yet from reading your contest? Uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, like the winner won the first year. Um, it, I, it was kind of a, it was kind of an affirmation to me because he said that he was on the verge of giving up writing because he'd just been banging his head against the wall. And then he, he won this contest and it's like, well, you know, maybe I do have what it takes. And um, so he said it gave him a shot in the arm and he started submitting again and, and, and then it wasn't long until he had a couple more pro sales, you know, within a year, you know. And uh, so... He probably got a little bit closer reading because he yeah. had something put in his cover. That may have helped, yeah. You know, that's what I would have done. <laughs> Stephen, you said the contests aren't for you. Why, why do you feel that you... I'm terrible about competition. It brings out the worst in me because... Well, instead of saying, that, talk about what you think competition can do badly for a young writer as well. For a young writer? Um, I think there are so many, there's so many emotional issues around competition in general that I think are bad for young writers. I, I, that whole comparing yourself to each other constantly thing, um, which nobody can help doing. You just, you can't. Um, I was in art school for a while, and oh my god, competition between, oh, competition between art students is, <laughs> you think it's, you think it's tough as writers. Oh my god, you at least get to work alone in, on your own and you don't have other people staring over your shoulder who are also students looking at your work going, oh, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so much better than you. And the implicit sense that you, when the teacher's going through portfolio review and he gets to somebody's work and he starts talking about it in terms he's never used for yours, which convinces you instantly that he hates yours because you are an incompetent hack who shouldn't have even been in art school, whereas this person is the true genius. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I think there are similar sorts of issues that, that come up in, in contests for, for young writers. So you think it does the that's opposite? What I like you think it's the opposite? It does the opposite of what poor Dr. I was saying. That that's I, what I feel. Yeah. But I mean, everything is not for everyone. Oh, this, is yes, why, this is why I support the, the workshop that is attached to this particular con. In a way, certain aspects of it are in fact a contest. Because only five manuscripts go before the Uber editor. Only five. 
and we have a committee that sit around and select those manuscripts just like a contest, right? So there is a contest aspect to it, but um, this way everybody gets feedback and everybody gets uh, some attention and everybody learns something new other than I didn't win. So that's why I support workshops over Those of you who do judge contests, are there differences in the ways that you look at work from the ways, say, uh, uh, someone like Gary Dussel, or Sheila Williams, or Stan Schmidt, or Jim Franklin looks at fiction? Are you looking for polish, potential, some combination of the both? I'm looking for a spark of originality because people with the best imaginations will have the best chance for a career. Is that what you think? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, to me, you know, I get so much stuff and it is so ordinary. You know, it doesn't have any life to it. It's the same old, same old. And so I'm looking for something new and different and representing the idea in some different way because I really feel like if, if you have a really good imagination, you're going to have a better chance for a career. Well, maybe. I mean, there, there are different schools of thought about this. I mean, I, I've taught Clarion a couple times, and, uh, and I remember at each Clarion uh, I've taught at, and, and the ones that Jones taught at, um, uh, basically, um, everybody has an idea of who is going to be the one to be the most successful, and or almost invariably all wrong. Because usually we think that the person who's the most original and creative and, and imaginative is going to be the most successful one, and it's almost always not true. The exception to this was the year Kelly Lynn was at Clarion, but Kelly is the exception to everything. Yeah, well, Kelly is Kelly is the exception to every rule. I mean, don't don't model yourself after Kelly Link. You will fail <laughs> because she is unique. And she know. didn't model herself after everything. Anyway. That's right. But but that's that's why I question what you're saying, because I mean, I, I understand that thought, and, and it's certainly, I mean, really, um, when I'm reading a, a, a manuscript that's submitted to me, whether it's a story for, a, you know, a workshop or a, or a novel or a proposal for a novel, I love originality, but, um, but, there, but there's, you know, originality is often very hard to sell. Um, it really is. Um, and it, you know, it's, um, you never, as an editor, you have to take risks. You know, you have to take risks. You have to go with things that are maybe difficult to sell because you know that if you can sell it, it's wonderful. Um, but at the same time, you also know that you need to have a job. And so that maybe people who are a little less original, but better storytellers or, um, or you know, have more engaging characters or, more or, or, or more accessible um, that thank you um, that that are going to enable you to um, you know, sell more books and this, still have a job next week. What I know you, that's harsh. But what do you true. look for? Do you look for polish? Do you look for 